Good afternoon. I'm Leslie Vosshall, the Robin Chemers Newstein Professor and Head of the Laboratory of Neurogenetics and Behavior at Rockefeller University. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this webinar presented by Rockefeller's Parents and Science Initiative. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, I'd like to extend you a special welcome. Normally we would be in Casper Auditorium, but alas, we are online. But before introducing this afternoon's distinguished speaker, Dr. Richard Friedman, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Rockefeller University. We were founded nearly 120 years ago. Rockefeller is one of the world's premier biomedical research institutions. Our credo is science for the benefit of humanity. What does this mean? First and foremost, Rockefeller laboratories conduct basic research to better understand the essential processes of life, health, and disease. The university's discoveries enrich human knowledge and also create new opportunities to treat, prevent, and eradicate a range of human illnesses. I can tell you personally, Rockefeller is a really exciting place to do science. Just yesterday, those of you who were awake at 6 a.m. heard the extraordinary news that Charlie Rice, the Maurice R. and Corinne P. Greenberg Professor in Virology and Head of the Laboratory of Virology and Infectious Disease, had been awarded the 2020 Nobel Prize in Medicine for his pioneering work in the discovery of the hepatitis C virus. His basic curiosity-driven research into viral genomes made it possible to develop safe drugs that can cure hepatitis C in nearly all patients who are treated. In effect, Charlie has put himself out of business as a scientist by enabling a cure for a major killer. But he's not resting on his laurels and has seamlessly transitioned his lab to other deadly viruses like Zika, Dengue, and of course, SARS-CoV-2. With Charlie's selection as a Nobel laureate, 26 Rockefeller faculty have now received the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Chemistry, including six in the last 21 years. Rockefeller scientists have also received 24 Lasker Awards, known as the American Nobel, since our founding in 1901. This is a truly unparalleled record of achievement. Compared to our peer institutions, Rockefeller is relatively small. We have no departments, just 75 laboratories, each led by a principal investigator who reports directly to our president, Richard Lifton. These scientists are hired for creativity, high risk, high reward approaches to science. And we're dedicated to ensuring that we have the resources we need to pursue our scientific interests. My own group was able to pivot to studying how mosquitoes find and bite people, a research program that I could not have conceived of when I first set up my own lab 20 years ago. Our small size and non-hierarchical structure are great sources of strength and they afford us enormous clarity of mission as well as the nimbleness to shift focus and follow science wherever it may lead us. A really important example is when the COVID-19 pandemic shut down New York City in early March, 25 of our labs shifted their focus immediately to the basic biology, pathophysiology, prevention, and treatment of COVID-19. It's a testament to the strength and resourcefulness of our community that we have since advanced innovative ideas and practical measures to influence the course of this truly terrible pandemic. For example, Jean-Laurent Casanova and his colleagues just published vital research in the journal Science that shows how genes and other individual biological differences may render some people especially vulnerable to severe illness from the novel coronavirus. His findings are especially important for understanding the rare cases where COVID-19 becomes life-threatening disease in children and young adults. And next month, we'll have the pleasure of listening to Michelle Nussenzweig, um, who has developed potent monoclonal antibodies um, against COVID-19. And these mo potent monoclonal antibodies will begin clinical trials. This is a major medical advance. Rockefeller, since its founding, has been through many epidemics and pandemics. And the work underway now is very much in keeping with our tra cherished tradition of service to humanity. If you would like to learn more about this research, please visit our website, rockefeller.edu. There you will find extensive information about our COVID-19 research initiatives, as well as videos of past webinars in which Rockefeller scientists have shared their findings on the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The university is committed to educating the public about the latest scientific 
discoveries and ideas. The Parents in Science Initiative that's hosting this event was launched more than a decade ago to provide a resource for parents and educators who want to know more about how contemporary research is transforming our understanding of childhood health and development. Today's webinar is part of a complementary series of programs that brings together Rockefeller scientists with childhood health experts, policymakers, physicians, and psychologists to discuss the latest discoveries related to the well being of children and adolescents. It's now my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Richard Friedman. We're in for a great treat. Richard is professor of clinical psychiatry and director of the psychopharmacology clinic at Weill Cornell Medicine. He's an expert in the neurobiology and treatment of mood and anxiety disorders. Really the number one thing on everyone's mind uh, this month is our increasing mood and anxiety. As a contributing opinion and science writer for the New York Times, Richard covers mental health, human behavior, and neuroscience. His opinion pieces tackle tough subjects that are familiar to many families today, such as addiction and the rise of teenage suicide, and often examine the impact of mental health policy on treatment. Richard received his undergraduate degree from Duke and his MD from the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School at UMD NJ. Today, as the new school year gets underway, Richard will share his insights into the toll the COVID-19 pandemic is taking on our mental health and we will also discuss coping strategies for us and our children. So before I turn the program over to Richard, I'd like to remind the audience that there will be a Q&A session after the talk. If you have a burning question, click on the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen at any time during Richard's presentation and type in your question. Richard, I'm delighted to turn the program over to you. Thank you so much, Leslie, for that lovely introduction and I want to say it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here with you all today, even though I'm here virtually um, in Zoom, um, which of course is a, a symptom of what it is that we're all going through. Um, and what I want to talk to you about is something that we're all dealing with um, in the midst of a pandemic, which is how to deal with the stress and the anxiety of such a difficult and uncertain situation, and in particular, how parents can better cope and how they can help their young kids and teenagers to better understand and to cope with what is going on um, around them. Um, um, just uh, hold on one moment. So to put in perspective what it is that I wanna to talk to you about, I think it's important just to start um, with a little bit of information about the extent uh, of COVID and how much it's had an impact on our everyday lives. And just to give you a sense of the scale of the pandemic, um, this is data as of September 25th, 2020. In the US, we've had 7 million cases of COVID and more than 200,000 deaths, uh, which gives a case fatality rate of about 3%. Worldwide, there have been 32 million cases and almost a million deaths with a very similar case fatality rate. And of course, we don't really know the true fatality rate because there are probably a large number of people who are infected asymptomatically. So that just makes the denominator very large. And one thing which I think is very uh, upsetting is to realize that though the United States has only about 4% of the world's population, it actually is uh, got 21% of all COVID deaths, something which is a startling statistic. So there are a number of very difficult psychological challenges that all of us have experienced during the pandemic. And so I wanna talk to you a little about these before we talk about how to deal with them, because I want everybody to come away from this talk with not just an understanding of how we're stressed, but actually what to do about it and how to make things better. But first, it helps to understand a little about some of the psychological challenges. The first one is to recognize that what makes the pandemic especially challenging is the uncertainty. This is, after all, an invisible enemy that seems to strike out of nowhere. And you don't really know whether you're safe or you're unsafe at any one time. 
which is not to say that we're powerless. It's disrupted our routine life. It's turned everything upside down, a sign of which is that I'm talking to you virtually and I'm not seeing you all in Caspery. Um, it's caused us to be locked down, which has led to being socially isolated. And as a result of that, we're stressed. We're social animals. We thrive mostly around being with people that we care about and we love. And um, that's a normal response to isolation and to being kept away from friends and also family with whom we're not living. And in a small number of us who are stressed, we're going to experience clinical levels of depression and anxiety. But I want to stress here that though it is very stressful what's going on to us, what's, what we're experiencing, most human beings are resilient. And even though we are stressed and stressed a lot, we don't develop clinical psychiatric illness from stress. We feel bad and stressed, but we thankfully are resilient. So the first thing is to understand a little bit more about why uncertainty is so aversive, why we don't like it. You know, we can adjust to good or bad situations, but uncertain outcomes are very unnerving, in part because we've been hardwired by evolution to detect novel threats and dangers in our environment, which is something that confers a considerable uh, survival advantage. We have to be able to recognize dangers in the world in order to avoid them and neutralize them. But the uncertainty in humans signals you know, dangers around the corner and it makes us vigilant and it makes us more anxious. So um, it's adaptive, it's protective, but we don't like the feeling. And you know, many of you know people or have this experience yourself. You know, for example, if you are waiting for the result of a medical test, let's say you have a biopsy to determine whether you have cancer, most people during the uncertain period before they get the results feel worse than they do after they get the results, even if the results are negative. Uncertainty is that aversive. So although we um, don't like uncertainty, we know how to protect ourselves when it comes to COVID. And so since we have this information, you know, wearing masks, social distancing, all of the public health science that we know, um, it's, it, there's no question that it will protect us, we then have to think about how we can help communicate some of these things to our young kids, um, which will also help them with the stress. So first, a few basic ideas and principles in talking with your kids. Children really need honest, direct information. And when this information is not present, young people make up stories to make sense of the situation on their own. If we don't provide them with explanations, they will make up their own explanations. And children who are between four and seven engage in what we call magical thinking, which is basically a belief that, you know, your thoughts and wishes and, and unrelated actions actually cause external events like COVID. So kids, young kids might actually feel that they've done something to bring about the pandemic. Um, of course, as an adult, you know that the pandemic is caused by a microbe, uh, a coronavirus, but young kids don't understand that. So the way you talk to them and explain these um, phenomenon and lower their anxiety and help them cope will depend on where they are developmentally. So children who are between three and five are much less likely to understand the notion of contagion and microbes. And so um, what we do is we help them understand that by staying home and using physical distancing and promoting all the hygiene, these are new activities that you know, we will reframe as being interesting and fun without scaring them because they're not gonna be capable of understanding all of the scientific explanations behind these behaviors. School age children, six to 12 year olds, they do have a basic understanding of germs and can understand that a virus is something that causes illness and makes you sick and is harmful, but they might not really understand um, how that's connected with what it is we want them to do to protect themselves. So we have to be very concrete in explaining it. So here's a couple of explanations that we might engage with kids. You could say a coronavirus is a new germ that spreads from person to person like a cold. Most people feel like they have a cold, but some people have trouble breathing and they may have other you know, serious symptoms. 
um, as well. And because this um, coronavirus is a new germ, scientists and doctors don't have a medicine yet to treat it, even though we're working on it. And this could take some time, months, maybe even a year, meaning we don't, we don't know yet how to cure it, but we're working on it and reassure them that this is going to happen eventually. Um, and then we can explain to our kids how to keep safe and um, help them understand that washing their hands, coughing and sneezing into their elbow uh, instead of their hands, um, and avoid touching one's face are really important to preventing the spread of coronavirus. These are very concrete, clear means of communicating. Explain why we want to keep a distance from people, which of course makes no sense to kids because you hug them all the time and you're always emphasizing the need for physical closeness and affection. Um, and you have to repeat it over and over because it's not intuitively obvious to kids and sadly also to many adults. Um, and although I really <laughs> have to refrain from injecting politics into the discussion today, I would be remiss in, in not noting that one of the things that's gonna make our job harder in communicating to our kids and our teenagers and is the fact that, you know, although the leadership of a country and administration can have an enormous impact on how we see the world and how we understand what's happening, unfortunately, this administration has ignored science, medical advice, and the knowledge of experts, which means you know, your young kids who have access to TV and to social media and to the internet get conflicting messages, which makes, you know, what it is that we have to do, which is to communicate science and medical and medical science harder. Um, and so when you talk to your kids, um, they may say, well, what happens if I get coronavirus? Um, they may be very frightened because, you know, uh, it's a new disease and they hear terrible, scary things on TV. And you um, have to say it's a lot like getting a cold or a flu. You might not feel well for a few days. You might have a sore throat or a stomach ache. Um, but to reassure them, but every time you get sick, you've, you've gotten better and we're gonna take care of you to reassure them. But it's not enough just to give data and information. It's very, very important, and we can talk about this in the discussion, to share your feelings, at least some of them. And you want to be able to balance being real and sharing something without scaring them and overwhelming them with your fear. So we naturally want to protect our kids from upset and to avoid um, sharing unnecessary anxiety and discomfort. But on the other hand, if you share something of your feelings, because they can see that your life is different, they can see home life is different, they understand something is different. If they don't understand how you're feeling, that goes along with these changes in your behavior, that will scare them. So as an example, share some of your feelings without overwhelming them, and it helps normalize their emotional reactions and reassures them, helps contain their fear, because now they understand why you're acting differently and why you're telling them these things about how they have to behave differently than they have in the past. And to help kids cope, aside with sharing how you feel, and giving them information about how to protect themselves, it's very, very important and very helpful to set up a regular schedule. You know, one thing the pandemic has done to us is it's made every day feel like every other day. And all the things we usually do that mark time, like getting up, you know, getting dressed, leaving the house or the apartment, going, commuting, going to work. I mean, these are all time givers during the day. They create a grid of structure. And suddenly this has just been pulled out from under our feet us and our loved ones. So we have to reimpose routine and structure and that's very, very important. The second thing that's important is helping kids stay in touch and probably you don't have to encourage them to do this, they do it anyway. Stay in touch with their friends um, by social media, by Zoom, by FaceTime, by WhatsApp, whatever. And I know that there are many parents who have concerns about you know, how much young people are exposed to social media and what that might do. But I think that there are very, very positive sides to social media, especially you know, in a time of coronavirus where people can't see one another directly face to face. 
this can be a remarkably useful technology to keep people connected to each other. Limit their exposure, uh, their exposure to TV um, that has scary images. And if they're going to watch TV, watch it with them. So you can put it in context and explain what it is that they're seeing. So it's less frightening. Physical exercise is critically important for mental and physical health. So encourage physical activity, walks, in-home exercise routines. Many of you have made use of apps on your phone to do exercises at home or videotapes. Regular exercise is very, very important. And then involve them in everyday activities so they're not spectators, meaning you know, involve them in menu planning and cooking and meals and all kinds of other household chores so they feel part of everyday structure. And then let them know that it's okay to feel scared and anxious and sad. And if this is a difficult time for everybody, including you, and it's okay to share this with them, um, they don't feel unsafe. It actually paradoxically has the opposite effect, it makes them feel you understand them. And since they can see that you're functioning and you're okay, you're modeling, how do you deal with being sad and anxious and still function? So don't hide your feelings from them. They'll know anyway. Give them space and downtime. They need time to process this and to be a little upset and unhappy. Reassure them that the pandemic will end, even if experts don't know exactly when. Uh, encourage them to take advantage of this time that they've got to learn and do something new, like reading a new book, playing a new game, learning a new skill, depending upon what their age is. I mean, there's just a wealth of um, you know, online learning uh, for kids of all ages. And then to put it in context so they know that this is not forever, talk about the future. Talk about the fact that, you know, when the pandemic is over, you're going to do, take a trip. You're going to go see your friends and relatives. You're going to go to the beach. You're going to do these things that, you know, are part of everyday life and fun that have always been there and they're not going to vanish. The pandemic will end. And then you know, you can also help them relax. Kids can learn to do mindfulness and relaxation exercises, just like adults. Uh, and these are basically guided exercises that stress regular breathing and mental exercises like mindfulness to induce states of relaxation. They're very effective. And kids, even as old as, you know, seven and eight, can learn how to do them. And there are lots of apps for this. I listed just a few here. Calm, Dreamy Kids, Breathe, Think Do, Smiling Mind, Headspace, um, which tends to be a bit more sophisticated and is probably better for teenagers. But the idea is these are apps that in a sort of programmatic way with, you know, sort of hand-holding, tell you at step one, two, and three what to do. Now close your eyes. I want you to be aware of your breathing. I want you to think it's coming from your stomach and all the way out through your mouth. You get the idea, it's sort of a guided exercise that leads them from the beginning of the exercise to the end. And these are very helpful for kids and adults too. But what about teenagers? So teens and young adults, meaning those who are 13 and up, have a better understanding, a more sophisticated understanding of coronavirus in the world, but they may not actually fully understand the severity of the situation. Um, not only that, but teenagers are notoriously sensation-seeking, exploratory. This is a time in life where people are breaking out on their own, forming new peer groups. And the task of being an adolescent is to sort of separate and individuate and be their own person and discover who they are. So that's why, you know, teenagers are constantly experimenting, you know, and they will try drugs and they're sexually more active. And so for them, coronavirus is a particular challenge because being locked up away from their friends is especially hard developmentally for where they are. And in addition, their exposure to social media, and they have lots of it, they bathe in social media, makes them very likely to be exposed to inaccurate information. And I always joke with my patients, uh, that, you know, all Google searches end in insanity or death. And I mean by that, that there are so many places to get bad information and inaccurate information that what you can do is to address the misunderstanding and help encourage them to access more reliable sources of information, of which there are many on the internet. 
And um, finally, I think it's important to realize that, you know, as we see spikes in second waves in coronavirus, particularly as kids go back to school, especially college age kids who, you know, um, you've all seen them running around the city without their masks on, they feel immortal. It's true that they are less likely to get sick because generally young people do better than older people. I think the thing to stress to them is, yes, it's true, you're not going to get sick, but you still are a vector and can spread the virus to others who are much more vulnerable, like us, meaning your, their parents uh, could get very sick and even die, like older adults and those with certain medical problems. So a sense of responsibility that you might not suffer, however others may suffer as a result of not taking these public health precautions. So then I wanna say a few words also about when stress goes beyond normal stress or unhappiness into a situation where you might wanna consider getting professional help. Stress in the setting of coronavirus is normal. It's a sign that you're alive and you're responding to something that's threatening. It's completely normal. So when is it not, when is it not okay? When is the stress something that requires the input of a clinician? Well, if your kid or teen complains of feeling chronically stressed or overly stressed in a way which is impairing their function, that's of concern. If they express thoughts or feelings of wanting to die or harm themselves, that's not normal stress. If they experience trouble with appetite, they have a change in appetite, they lose their appetite, they have more trouble sleeping than usual, they wake up in the middle of the night, they get up early, they have a uh, loss of energy or concentration, and if they exhibit a loss of interest in activities that usually they enjoy and they're socially withdrawn and they don't wanna see their friends and they just are glum and they you know, isolate themselves in their room, then it's time to think about whether or not you know, you're dealing with a situation of clinical anxiety or clinical depression. And it's time then, if you see any of those signs or symptoms to seek professional help. So in sum, just to think about some of the takeaway points from today, stress, anxiety, and sadness, they're all normal. They're all expected during the pandemic. People are very resilient. Most people will not develop a psychiatric illness from stress, and you needn't fear stress. It's normal. Be honest and encourage daily structure, healthy diet, sleep, exercise, and various relaxation strategies. Seek professional help when appropriate when you see the signs and symptoms we just spoke about. And never forget to remember yourself and also to remind your kids that the pandemic will come to an end. I listed here some additional resources that you can access online uh, from the CDC, the Child Mind Institute, and the National Association of School Psychologists. I think these are all very good um, with the usual caveats about you know, things that we discussed before. So I think that I'm going to stop. I'm very, very happy to have had the chance to talk with you today. And now we're going to go into a um, question and answer period where we can have a discussion about some of the things that you are interested in. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, uh, for your terrific presentation. I personally feel a lot calmer than I did 30 <laughs> minutes ago. <laughs> Um, as a parent of a teenager who's currently socially isolating uh, 3,000 miles away, I really appreciate all the coping strategies you shared with us. So we have a very large number of questions. I will um, start offering them up to you and let's, let's see where it goes. Um, can you address adolescents who are perhaps most attuned to the ripple effects of COVID and subject to the ambient stress of the moment? Political chaos, racial unrest, upended college admissions process, the cumulative effect seems to be overwhelming sense of hopelessness and loss. Yes, what a wonderful, powerful, and almost impossible question to answer. So what I would do is I would start with reality. And that is to say, there is no getting around the fact that that question responds to a real stress. F meaning for teenagers, what they're looking at is not just the stress of a pandemic, but the loss of a of, of a future, the, the idea that what they expect in life at this moment, which is to be able to finish school, to go to college, to be with their friends, suddenly feels threatened. So I think the very first thing you have to do is to say, yes, this is an extremely upsetting time. And 
I know this is gonna be hard for you to deal with. We're gonna find ways for you to do this while it's going on, but I don't want you to think that this pandemic is going to be here forever. It's not. It's going to change your life. There's no question about it, but we're gonna find a way for you to adapt. And this is a challenge. And I think putting it in this frame helps them see that A, it's not hopeless and it's not helpless. And B, you're gonna help them adapt and find a way to deal with this that may not be along the lines of what they were expecting at this moment, which is they're gonna be hanging out and going to parties with their friends. Um, but that they're going to be able to find an adaptation that's maybe not totally satisfactory, but it's not the worst case scenario either. Fantastic. Uh, here's one um, about little kids. How do you address the fears of very young children who crave stability? E.g., my six-year-old is very anxious already and is freaking out about our local coffee shop closing. I love that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in that case, what you have to do is tell them that you also feel very upset yourself, but you're not afraid. There's a difference between being sad and being anxious. This kid is expressing a sense of fear, not just that that coffee shop will close, but maybe more of the world that this six-year-old is aware of is somehow gonna disappear. So I think what you have to do is to assure them, yes, it's true, some businesses are gonna have difficulty, but there are other things that are gonna pop up. There are other things that are going to, that other businesses, when all this is over, that are gonna be there on the street. And it is not the end of the world. Now, it may be that no matter what you do, this six-year-old is so anxious. And if you can't console a six-year-old by reassurance, then I think it's time to think about seeking professional help for them. Wonderful. Uh, so this is about elderly parents. I realize this is focused on, this discussion's focused on potential coping strategies for parents and their children, but I'm wondering about some potential strategies to help working adults and their elderly parents. It's a great question. So, you know, the elderly are particularly vulnerable because, you know, younger people are such experts at social media and they can be connected. What I worry about with older people is the loss of connection, social connection, because many of them either don't have smart devices or don't have access to Zoom, et cetera. So one thing is to see whether it's possible to give them access to it. I mean, this is a very concrete solution and something we're working on in the clinic is expanding you know, availability for you know, virtual connectivity for those that can do it. That, that is one thing. The other is if you can't do that, the phone is a remarkably sure, safe, and consoling means of connecting to people. The human voice, even if you can't see somebody, the human voice is incredibly powerful. So don't feel that if you can't visit them or you can't see them, that the connection isn't powerful. It is. Great. What are the long-term effects of social distancing on behavior, health, and personality? Can we foster healthy relationships from a distance? And if not, how can we innovate and adapt? What a wonderful question. So we're social creatures and social isolation brings about stress and severe social isolation brings about severe psychological stress and you know, increases the risk of depression and anxiety and all kinds of problems. One of the open questions is whether virtual connection is going to prove as real and as beneficial as, you know, in face person to person connection. And as yet, we don't actually have the data to know the answer to that. My guess is talking to friends who do research in this area, that if you already know somebody, a face to face is not necessary and you can pretty much maintain your connection with them virtually um, by Zoom. But meeting people for the first time might be harder because we're tactile and we're used to being in three dimensions and touching one another and smelling one another and all that stuff. So I think the answer to the question is, we don't know yet. It may be much less uh, than people assume because if you can maintain virtual connection, you're gonna be connected. We have such sophisticated questions here. Um, is there lasting harm that can result from not allowing a young school-aged child, age six, play with peers for eight to 12 months, and this child has no siblings? Well, 
I think it depends on the extent of the deprivation and isolation and how long it goes on for. I mean, people are pretty resilient and we are probably dealing with a situation of months to a year in which we experience the degree of isolation that we've got now. I mean, assuming that we have therapeutics and a vaccine. So I, I don't know that we're in the, in the realm of you know, permanent psychological and neurobiological effects of isolation in young people. Though I know what the question is getting at is, you know, young people are in their sort of developmentally sensitive phase where the brain is exquisitely sensitive to inputs or the absence of them. So it is worrisome. But on the other hand, they are stimulated by you and all of the things and activities that you do. And so they may not have their peers to play with, but they're not sensory deprived in, the, in that way. Yeah. So, um, so now on to teenagers. Uh, how would you suggest that teenagers stay connected with their peers in a constructive way during the pandemic? And I think emphasis on constructive rather than going outside and taking your masks off and being crazy. Yeah. It's, it's difficult with teenagers because, you know, teenagers are notoriously rebellious. And if one sure way to get a teenager, you know, um, to ignore you is to give them an order. In fact, if you say, don't do X, they're more likely to do X. If you can find a way to make a desirable behavior hip and cool, all the more beneficial. Because if you can say, you know, for example, you can see all your friends on social media and hang out and play games and do whatever it is you like to do by seeing them. And, you know, even encourage them by saying you're doing, it depends on what the teen is like, but you're doing something which is so socially valuable that you're a hero, you know, to sort of reward them and say, it's just an amazing thing to be able to do this as a young person, to change the, to, to be able to change the face of a pandemic by your behavior, by not going out and taking your mask off, by not infecting other people. So I think you want to you want to spin it as, you know, they're doing a really socially, you know, desirable thing by doing a good thing. So the, the next pertains to uh, school-aged children. So I, I, as we know, I mean, I, I see out and about in New York City, there's some of the schools are, are open for in-person classes. A, a lot are still virtual. So the question is, have you seen children stop going to school, like refusing to go to school or have a fear of going to school and isolating during this time, how do you treat this? I think, you know, I think the idea would be like they're, they're offered in-person classes, but they're, they're too afraid to go. Yeah, I mean, it's not clear in cases where kids refuse to go to school. School refusal is a common problem in kids, even apart from the pandemic. Um, and I mean, I'm not a child psychiatrist and no expert in school refusal, but it seems to me that you know, if a kid is frightened of being in the class, that as a first step, a virtual classroom would be far more beneficial because if they're really anxious, being in that classroom is going to impair their ability to learn. And it's probably preferable not to push them to do something they're so frightened of. Yeah, and I think that that's, it seems like the school system has allowed people the option. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, especially when you're saying to them on the one hand, social distance is a good thing. If you push them to go to school, they'll turn around and say, but wait a second, you're telling me I should be social. I don't get it. That doesn't you're make any sense. <laughs> you're a confusing parent. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so this is about uh, social engagements, obviously birthday parties, weddings, funerals, everything has been turned upside down. So this is a question. Do you have any advice for navigating the expectations and responsibilities of social engagements is there a healthy way to approach social engagements like play dates, birthday parties, hanging out with friends in a way that everyone can feel comfortable? How do you approach these pre-engagement conversations? I think this is about, you know, do you tell the parents ahead of the play date that everyone must be masked and stand six feet apart? And... You can, but the likelihood of actually being able to make it happen are probably, you know, close to zero because, you know, kids, it's hard enough for adults to do it. I mean, just think when you leave the apartment and you put on your mask and then for some reason you take it off and you forget to put it back on again. I mean, 
kids don't have the same ability to carry out, you know, planning and executive functioning like that. You know, when the weather was warm, of course, it would be possible to meet outside and do things outside. But now what are we going to do when we all have to be inside? Well, it depends on your degree of risk and whether you want to socialize with people that have been, you know, sort of isolated and you're in a pod, meaning, you know, there has to be trust between you and your social, um, you know, your, your, your social connections. So there's no easy way to do this. I mean, the safest would be every, every party is virtual, but it's unsatisfying to young kids. Um, so if it's gonna be in person, you have to somehow limit the number of kids that are gonna be there and assume that you're not gonna control them. Yeah, I think this is one of the hardest things, especially because winter is coming and no one ha really has a solution to, uh, no. to anything. And we're very afraid that we're gonna have a second wave if people don't yeah. carry out, you know, masks and isolation and distancing. Absolutely. Um, we're going all over the place from two-year-olds to 90-year-olds. So let me, let me do a 90-year-old. So my parents were both COVID casualties at the end of March, died 10 hours apart, one mile away from one another. Um, my father was frail but healthy. My mother was starting to live life on her own. Um, I, of course, couldn't be present. I haven't fallen apart yet. Why? Uh, so first of all, I'm so sorry to hear that. I, I too lost my mother, you know, to COVID. 94 years old, took one week. So I understand. Actually, the reason you haven't fallen apart is because you, like most people, are resilient. And although you might be sad and grief stricken, most people don't fall apart when they're stressed and they experience loss and grief. They feel that and sad and all of those things, but you're not undone by it. That's just the nature of who, as humans, we are. We're resilient. We bounce back after feeling bad. Thank you. Um, so I feel like it's the heyday for Netflix and Amazon and, and every other <laughs> provider. We, we probably spent most of our lives as parents saying like, don't binge watch, like turn off the TV. Now we encourage everybody to watch as much TV as possible. <laughs> so the question is, uh, please share your views on the effects of pandemic driven digital media overuse on children's mental health. Yeah, this is such a wonderful question. So even before the pandemic, right, people were very worried about the exposure of young people to digital technology. And, and I have to say, I, I, it's, it's an interest of mine. So I, I have read much of the research in this area. I can tell you, even though people are worried about it, it's actually really hard to demonstrate that there's any long-term damage or risk by exposure. Most of the studies that are done are association studies, finding correlations, let's say, between anxiety and the number of hours on a smartphone or depression and the numbers of hours on a smartphone. But you never know from those studies in which direction the causal arrow goes. It could be that anxious, depressed kids are more likely to spend time on their phone and that the, the you know, digital use is a symptom of the problem, not the other way around. Um, there's very little longitudinal data. So I would say I wouldn't worry so much about that. The human brain evolved over many hundreds of thousands of years. And, you know, we're pretty resilient. And, um, well, my colleague is an expert in epigenetics. I, I, I don't know that the exposure would do anything, um, except it may prevent them from developing other skills like reading. So given the pandemic and the fact that it's gonna be finite, I would give them a pass, really. And I have to say a huge proportion of the questions we received in advance were about how, how can I make my child get, get off his or her phone and get off of Netflix. So thank yeah, you for I giving mean, them a pass. I, I, I'm not sure you wanna do that because yeah. if you did that, then what would they be doing? They yeah. would be anxious and roaming around looking for structure. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned this wonderful term, magical thinking, and, and this question incorporates that. Uh, so there seems to be magical thinking among adults that things will automatically go back to normal on 1-1-2021. One, one, 20, Even though we may know that's irrational, how do we prepare for the inevitable disappointment when the calendar rolls over and things are still the same? So, uh, right. So I would say, you know, um, 
think about it like this. You know, when, when you are adapting to a threat and you're doing everything right, denial is a perfectly reasonable adaptation, meaning not to be overwhelmed by the possibility of another bad outcome right around the corner because you are doing what is necessary at the moment and to deal with what's right in front of you. I think that to over adapt to a current problem as though it's going to be the new norm is a mistake because it's likely just given history. And, you know, we live in the 21st century, you know, we're not in the 13th century, you know, dealing with, you know, the bubonic plague. This is as scary as it is, you know, coronavirus is a, is a, is a virus we will one day have a vaccine. Um, and, you know, yes, it's true that things could get worse after they get better. Um, I, would, I would say you have to deal with what's in front of you now. And I would push off, you know, prognosticating about how bad things are going to be in six months or a year. Who could know? It's kind of, it's hard to, it's hard to plan and, and really would be a mistake to try to adapt now in the present for a future that is so in flux. I think a little denial when you're doing the right thing and taking care of yourself is perfectly fine. Great. We're, we're in this um, extended experiment where many, many parents are finding themselves homeschooling, right? Which is something that's most people have never attempted to do. So the question is, what's the best way to minimize parent and child stress while homeschooling? Such a great question. I mean, considering that you're there all the time with your kids, homeschooling them, I would say you want to have a mixed model where, you know, the instruction is a little bit of your input and a lot of stuff and a lot of the teaching where the kids are actually doing things by themselves with, you know, sort of intermittent supervision, supervision from you and also web-based learning where you don't have to be directly involved because you have such a presence in their life that I think the overexposure could be very stressful, not just to them, but to you. Great. And we've all spent, um, I, I think I calculated, I've spent more time with my husband in the last seven months than in the preceding 20 years, right? People have made those calculations. Yes. <laughs> and relationships have, you know, floundered um, many. Yeah. People have spent much more time with one another. It's a great year for Netflix and divorce lawyers, perhaps. So. Right. Um, okay. So here's, here's another really good one. Teenage boys are particularly drawn to video games, which are superbly addictive. Ours is no exception. His rationale is that it's, quote, social. How much is the right amount? So I would say, you know, when you say addictive, I mean, anything that somebody likes and they like a lot, you know, you can say, you can use, we throw the word addiction around, I think, very easily. It's not addictive in the sense that, you know, if he stops playing the video game, he'll have a symptom of medical withdrawal as he would with like a drug like alcohol. Addictive in the sense that it might not be good for him emotionally or developmentally. Yes, maybe it's not desirable. I would say, you know, to the extent that he is not socializing, not having contact with other people, then it's a problem. But if he's with his friends and he's playing games with his friends and he's also, you know, playing games by himself, I, as I said before, I would not worry so much because we're, we're talking about a, a relatively finite period of time, not years, but months. Uh, so this is... Um near and dear to my heart because I'm definitely doing a lot of stress eating. <laughs> so any recommendations to combat teen stress eating and poor nutrition during the pandemic? Yeah, I think, well, one thing is exercise, I think really does help. The other is, you know, who controls what's in the food? Who controls what's in the house? So if you don't have it in the house, you can't eat it. So you could redesign the, I know it's, it, it, it seems like a lot of work, but since we're all at home, there's nowhere to go. You know, I like to cook and so I go out and I buy things and I make them. So you can make a conscious decision, okay, I'm not going to have fast, high dense, high caloric food in the house. I'm going to have, you know, fruits and nuts and grains and, you know, healthier things so that, you know, you can't eat what you don't have access to. That is such a great idea. Um, 
now we're going to turn all of this negativity around and you're going to help us. It's so easy to focus on the negative aspects of the pandemic. What do you see as the positive outcomes, the silver linings of the personal and collective experiences of living through a pandemic? Thank you for that question. So I would say collectively, we're going to come away with this being more resilient. And, you know, there's no getting away from the sort of old fashioned notion that you know, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Nietzsche said this. And, you know, being exposed to adversity is painful, but it's growth enhancing as well. And I think as awful as this is, both the illness, the loss, the grief, the social isolation, the, our lives being turned upside down, when it ends, we will have gone through an enormous social, a huge, uncontrolled social experiment in stress, isolation, and adversity. And most, the vast majority of people will not get physically ill or psychiatrically ill. They're probably going to come away with a combination of more resilience and, and loss. It's a mixed picture, but it's not, it's not all bad. Great. Um... This one, I really feel because our daughter went through the college application process last year, and I think college application for, for high school seniors is like the biggest stressor in a young life. Um, and the consequences of, of all the upheaval will definitely affect students this year. So this um, attendee says, I want to know more about how the pandemic will affect my college applications and decisions and figure into decisions about universities. So I think basically, huge numbers of kids who were admitted this fall are deferring. You can see the, the spiral of anxiety. My chances of getting in are going down. So, so what, what do you think about that? Well, actually, you can turn it around and look at it from another angle, which is because a lot of kids will be deferring, the chances of getting in at certain institutions might actually be higher because the acceptance rates you know, being what they are, you know, you've got a, a smaller, you know, denominator and, you know, kids basically say, I'm going to take a year. Oh, I, I have friends whose kids got into very competitive colleges, probably because so many kids deferred um, and they didn't want to. So, you know, on the one hand, you're denied the social experience in many colleges because, you know, it's all on Zoom, like we're talking. I mean, how much fun is this to, you know, compare if we were sitting together in the auditorium you know, and I could see you and you could see me, it, it, you know, it would be a different experience. For kids, it's even more vivid. So I think it's true that the experience is going to be very altered and many may opt just to push it off rather than to have this diluted, socially distant, virtual experience of college. Yeah. So this, this could be the year to get into your selective college of choice. Absolute, let's let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, Okay, so this is Parents in Science. Uh, we have a question from a 15-year-old. That's great. We have a 15-year-old high school student who says that she's enjoyed listening to your lecture. I noticed that there were very few PSAs, I guess public service announcements about the virus, preventative measures that are directed at younger kids. I would love to share the animated film I created with the parents of six to 12 to help, help them explain COVID, why should they wear a mask and wash their hands? So there's a link, I think that's really interesting. Um, so what, what do you think about how you actually explain that? It's so weird to little kids now from one day to the next, they always have to have their face covered. What, what are the strategies? I love that. That's fantastic. I would love to see your movie, actually. Um, and I think that's a wonderful point, which is, you know, so much of, well, whatever advice we get publicly um, is directed at adults and bypasses young people. And as you know, and as you, you're saying, you know, you can't um, lecture a five-year-old and talk to them the way we're talking about the virus and what to do, but maybe what you need is an animation. You know, something, you need, the, you need the language that is geared towards the person you're dealing with. So a five-year-old needs a cartoon and needs a movie, like the kind of thing that you did, and I'd love to see it, you know, where you can actually show them, you know, by some of their favorite cartoon characters or animated characters, what to do to be safe. That's, fa that's a great idea. It's great, yeah, so the, it's, her name is Christina Chuliver and we'll, we'll uh, I'll definitely, we'll try to send the link around. I can't yeah, wait to see great, it. Yeah, that's great, Christina. Um, 
Okay, this is a really Zen question. I think this will be our second to last question. Any thoughts on getting outdoors from the Japanese practice of forest bathing to birding, to fishing, hiking, hunting, all lend themselves to social distancing and for city folk can be a real adventure, an excellent opportunity right now, positive outcome. I guess more of a comment than a question. Yes, and it's such a wonderful one because there, there are very few things that are as consoling and health promoting as exposure to nature. And being a swimmer, and I will go in any body of water I could possibly find, I've spent the entire summer looking for lakes and ponds to swim in. And the effects are remarkable, as, as this question, you know, said, yes, we should have as much exposure to being in nature as possible, in the parks, being near water. Yes, it's very, very, very beneficial. And, and those of you who are in New York City, we're obviously lucky to have just a really, uh, you know, verdant parks and, lo and lots of opportunities to get outside. Um, so I think I'm going to wrap it up there. Richard, thank you again for this calming, informative, outstanding presentation. And I want to thank everybody who tuned in this afternoon. Uh, I hope you found it as useful as I did. Um, and importantly, if you enjoyed this afternoon's webinar, we invite you to make a gift, small or large, to the Parents and in Science Initiative at Rockefeller. Your support helps us fund these webinar series and the pioneering biomedical research of the scientists at Rockefeller University. Shortly, there'll be a closing slide that provides more information about how you can contribute. And again, thanks everybody for um, spending an hour with us today and the wonderful Dr. Friedman. Good afternoon. <laughs>